Our story opens at 221 Baker Street, the home and office of one Mr. Sherlock Holmes. His trusty sometimes assistant, Dr. John Watson, is studying a cane. Dr. Watson has always admired Sherlock's ability to access mountains of information from a small clue, so he thought he would try his hand at it. The cane had been left by the visitor of the night before. It was a fine, thick piece of wood, bulbous-headed, of the sort which is known as a penning lawyer. Just under the head was a broad silver band nearly an inch across. To James Mortimer, MRCS, from his friends of the CCH, was engraved upon it with the date 1884. Sherlock, whose back was to Watson, asked what he thought of it. When Watson asked how Sherlock knew what he was doing, he replied that he saw Watson's reflection in the coffee pot. Watson begins to give his deductions, trying to use some of Sherlock's powers of observation. He speculates that the cane belonged to an older doctor who was given the cane as appreciation for years of service. Getting a bit of encouragement from Sherlock, he continues with the idea that the doctor walked a lot since the cane was well-worn. He further reasons that the CCH stands for the something hunt a local hunt that the doctor must have performed a service. While Watson is thinking how brilliantly he used his deductive powers, Sherlock tells him it was interesting, though elementary. Then Sherlock begins to list the observations he has made. While Watson is right about the man being a county practitioner, the CCH stands for Charing Cross Hospital. Since the cane would have been given as a going-away present, the man must be fairly young, not old as Watson had surmised, and the man must have a small spaniel dog since there are bite marks in the bottom of the cane. Also, the man and dog are at the door. The man introduces himself as Mortimer. He is a phrenologist. He studies skulls to determine intelligence and character. Relieved to see that he had left his cane there, Mortimer proceeds to consult Holmes on a case since he considers Holmes the second highest expert in Europe. When Holmes asks the first is, the man replies, Monsieur Bertolin. Doyle was a huge fan of Bertolin, who discovered the method of anthropomorphic identification. Before fingerprinting, the exact measurement system Bertolin developed was important in identifying criminals. Sherlock suggests that Mortimer go see Bertolin if he's so great. Mortimer replies that Sherlock would be the best choice for this case, and he hoped he didn't offend. Sherlock says for him to get on with it. Of course now Sherlock must seem even smarter. So, when Mortimer pulls a manuscript from his pocket, Sherlock tells him, before it's even completely out, that the manuscript is from 1730s. The manuscript is actually dated 1742 and tells the story of the curse of the Baskervilles. During the time of the Revolution, Hugo Baskerville, who held the manor of Baskerville at the time, was a lecherous, profane, and godless man. Hugo desired a local farmer's daughter, who he kidnapped and held her in a room, upstairs. While Hugo was downstairs carousing with his friends, the girl escaped down an ivy-covered wall and set off across the moorland. The furious Hugo made a deal with the devil and released his hounds to chase her. Hugo took off with his dogs, and his drunken friends followed afterward. When they found Hugo and the girl, they were both dead. She had died of fear and fatigue. He had had his throat ripped out by some great beast. Since that time, the beast has haunted the family of Baskervilles. The most recent victim is Sir Charles Baskerville. Next, Mortimer shows Sherlock the newspaper article mentioning the death of Sir Charles, a well-respected, philanthropic man who had remade his family's fortune in South Africa. The story stated that his servants, Mr. and Mrs. Barrymore and Mortimer, were all interviewed. According to their reports, Sir Charles was found dead of a heart attack at the site of his nightly walk down New Alley, an area bordering the Merlins where the beast is rumored to roam. The article mentioned the myth of the curse upon the Baskervilles, but only to discount it. The article goes on to name the new owner of Baskerville, Sir Charles' younger brother, Henry, who is in America. Next, Mortimer tells Sherlock of the facts he'd left out of the paper. For an unknown reason, Sir Charles had lately become more and more agitated. The curse was playing on his nerves, and he thought he saw shadows in the moors. On the night he died, evidence suggested Charles dawdled at the gate to the alley. His footsteps down the alley were curious. He seemed to alternate between tiptoeing and running, but the most surprising addition that the newspapers didn't know about was the footprints of a colossal hound next to Sir Charles Tiptoes. Now he has piqued Sherlock's interest. He begins to question Dr. Mortimer. He learns the footprints could not have come from a sheepdog. The paw prints did not approach the body, but were twenty yards away, and the night was damp and raw, but not raining. Then Sherlock wants to know what the alley looks like. He's told there is a strip of grass about six feet wide on either side, and it is bordered by an old 12-foot-high yew hedge on each side. The yew is impenetrable. The walk itself is about eight feet across. There is only one opening, a wicked gate leading onto the moor. 
The exit is through a summer house at the far end, but Sir Charles was within fifty yards of it. The paw prints were on the same side of the path as the moor gate, and the gate was padlocked, but it is only four feet high, so anyone could have gotten over it. After answering all Sherlock's questions, Mortimer said that the reason he hesitated about investigating further was that, as a man of science, he did not want to entertain the idea of a demon haunting the Baskervilles, but after interviewing many of the locals, he is left with questions. When Sherlock asks him if he wants him to investigate, Mortimer says that's not why he is there, he just wants advice on what to do about Sir Henry Baskerville, who is due to arrive in an hour from Canada. Sherlock inquires if Sir Henry is the only claimant, and Mortimer tells him that another brother, Roger, was the black sheep of the family. He fled England to Central America, where he contacted yellow fever and died. There were three brothers, Charles, the second brother, who was Henry's father, and Roger. Even though Mortimer fears for the safety of Sir Henry, he knows the county needs a lord of the manor at Baskerville to keep the economy moving. Sherlock points out that if the danger is supernatural as Mortimer infers, then he is not safe no matter where he is, so there is no reason to stop him. But not to tell him of the curse until Sherlock had some time to ruminate on the subject. He will have an answer the next day at ten o'clock. Mortimer heads to meet Sir Henry, and Sherlock settles down with his pipe and thinking. When Dr. Watson returns, he finds Sherlock in the room, billowing in smoke. Sherlock surmises Watson went to the club and then pulls out a map to study the area in question. He wants to discount all the natural possibilities before settling on the supernatural. What would draw a man who was elderly and infirm to go out into the night, wait by the gate for quite a while, and as the change in the footsteps indicate, run as if for his life, but away from the house, not towards then deciding to put aside the thoughts on the mystery until he sees Sir Henry and Mortimer on the next day, Sherlock takes up his violin to relax. When Sir Henry arrives the next morning, he bears a note that he received warning him away from the manor house if he valued his life and sanity. After reviewing the note, Sherlock concludes the note is in a plain envelope with plain rough writing. The note is composed of words cut out of the newspaper, except for the word more, Holmes deduces the writer must be following Sir Henry. How else would he know where to find him? The words were cut out of the Times, yesterday's to be exact. Also, the writer used a pair of short nail clippers. Also, the writer must be well-educated since only the well-educated read the Times. Since the writer was trying to conceal his slasher handwriting, their signature must be easily recognizable. And he must have been in a hurry as the words are glued carelessly, recognizing he has impressed his audience. Sherlock continues to point out that since the pen was running low on ink, the person is probably staying in a hotel. He tells them that if they try the hotel nearest Charing Cross, they will probably find the rest of the newspaper the words were clipped from. Sherlock asks Sir Henry if anything unusual has happened, and he replied that when he put his boots outside his room for polishing, one was stolen. Holmes decides to tell Sir Henry the story of the curse, but Sir Henry wants to go to Baskerville anyway. He wants to determine if his uncle's death needed a policeman or a clergyman. After inviting Holmes and Watson to lunch later in the day, he and Dr. Mortimer leave. Sherlock springs to action. He and Watson will grab a cab and follow Sir Henry. They hope to spot the letter writer. When they catch sight of him, they can only make out a bushy black beard. Unfortunately, Sherlock makes a rookie mistake and is spotted by the man. He does manage to note the cab number, though. Sherlock asks a young boy to go through the trash in the hotels in the Charing Cross looking for the cut-up times while he and Watson investigate the cab before they have to meet Sir Henry for lunch. After sending a wire to learn the information on the cab and its occupant, Sherlock and Watson spend some time in a gallery while waiting for their lunch meeting. When they arrive at the hotel, the desk clerk allows Sherlock to check the registry where he deduces the spy is not staying in the hotel. When they go upstairs, they find Sir Henry enraged. Another boot has been stolen, this one an older boot. Sir Henry is surprised that Holmes now thinks the thefts may be related to the case. During lunch, the men discuss the case at length. Holmes discovers that the butler, Mr. Barrymore, matches the description of the bearded man. So, Holmes sends a telegram to Baskerville. If Barrymore is not there, it will return to him. Mortimer says that Barrymore inherits 500 pounds and an easy job on Charles' death. Also, Mortimer, himself, receives 1,000 pounds and Sir Henry 740,000 pounds. The next in line to inherit is a couple of distant cousins, a couple named Desmond. Since Sherlock has prior commitments and can't go to Baskerville right away, he suggests Watson go as a bodyguard to Sir Henry. Before they leave the lunchroom, Sir Henry finds his boot. 
back at 221 Baker Street, Holmes and Watson go over the case but find even fewer answers. Barrymore was not in London, and the cut-up newspaper was not located. But when they interview the cab driver, they think they finally have a clue until he tells them the fare used the name Sherlock Holmes. When Watson leaves the next day to accompany Sir Henry, Sherlock tells him to only send him the facts and not conjectures, and that he has eliminated the Desmonds as suspects, then reminds him to bring his gun. Upon arriving at Baskerville, Sir Henry Mortimer and Watson see some armed policemen. Apparently, a convict, Selden, the Notting Hill murderer, has escaped and is suspected to be in the area. Mortimer parts ways and heads to his own home. At Baskerville Hall, Sir Henry and Watson are met by Mr. and Mrs. Barrymore. At dinner that night, Sir Henry learns the Barrymore's plan to leave his employ and use their inheritance to open a shop. Later, Sir Henry remarks on how creepy the place is and Watson thinks he hears a woman crying after he goes to bed. The next morning, Watson deduces the crying woman was Mrs. Barrymore and then wonders if perhaps the person in London was Mr. Barrymore after all. So he questions the postmaster's boy, only to discover the wire was delivered to Mrs. Barrymore, who said her husband was upstairs. As the mystery deepens, Watson wishes for Sherlock to hurry. On the way back to Baskerville, Watson meets the Stapleton siblings, brother and sister. He is a naturalist, running around with a butterfly net, and she is beautiful, but a little creepy. Mr. Stapleton walks ways with Watson, giving him a guided tour of the area, saying how glad he is to have Sir Henry there and hoping he is as philanthropic as his uncle. Mr. Stapleton is very nosy and asks about Sherlock and the case. Watson doesn't comment. While Stapleton runs after a butterfly, Miss Stapleton comes up to warn Watson to leave. She seems to think he is Sir Henry. But when she learns otherwise, her cancer warning. In his first report to Sherlock, Watson relates the budding romance between Sir Henry and Miss Stapleton that her brother doesn't quite approve. He tells of meeting Mr. Franklin, who uses a telescope to search the moors for the escaped convict who no one has seen for two weeks, so residents think he has left the area, and also that he doesn't trust Mr. Barrymore. Sir Henry questioned him about the wire, but he insists he was home. Then there is the candle. One night, Watson follows Barrymore down a hall. He's toting a candle, which he brings to the window, then seems to signal someone outside. Also, Mrs. Barrymore cries every night. In a second report, Watson speculates that Barrymore is having an affair with a country girl. Since the window, he signals from faces the moor, and his wife cries so much. When he tells Sir Henry, they decide to stake out the window and confront Barrymore. But before that can happen, there is a scene between Sir Henry and Miss Stapleton, who he is courting. When he wanted to talk about romance, she kept warning him away from Baskerville, and when he tried to kiss her, her brother came upon them and began to rant. Afterward, he apologized and asked Sir Henry over for dinner next Friday. After two nights of the stakeout, Watson and Sir Henry finally get the chance to catch Barrymore. They find out from Mrs. Barrymore that the signal is to the escaped convict, who is her brother. They have been bringing him food. Sir Henry and Watson go out to capture the convict for the good of the community. They find him, but he gets away. They hear the moan of a wolf while in the moors, and Watson sees the silhouette of a mysterious tall figure, but it disappears. Sir Henry and Watson try to convince Barrymore that he needs to help them capture his brother-in-law. But he asserts the man is harmless and is just waiting to board his ship to South America. They agree to let the matter drop, and as thanks, Barrymore tells them that Sir Charles was supposed to meet a woman the night of his death. They learn the woman was the daughter of Franklin, Laura Lyons. Years ago, she had married a man against her father's wishes. Her father disowned her, and then her husband left her. She is destitute. Sir Charles and Mortimer have been helping. Her as for the silhouette of Selden, the convict has seen him, too. He seems to be a gentleman who lies in a Neolithic hut by the moor. A young boy brings him food. The mystery of the stranger has an entertaining build-up that culminates in finding out the stranger is Sherlock Holmes. He has been staying in the hut, undercover. Investigation. He and Watson compare notes. Holmes has discovered that Laura and Mr. Stapleton are close and that Miss Stapleton is actually his wife. Stapleton is actually the villain. He used his wife to lure Sir Henry and Laura. Then he seduced Laura and used her to get to Sir Charles. Sherlock and Watson decide to tell Laura the truth about Stapleton, hoping to change her loyalties. But first, they hear a scream from the Moors. At first, they think they have discovered the body of Sir Henry, but it turns out that Barrymore had given some old clothes of Sir Henry's to Selden. The hound was given Sir Henry's lost boot to sniff and went for Selden wearing the clothes. Stapleton arrives thinking to find Sir Henry and is surprised it is not him. 
Sherlock leads Stapleton to believe he is finished with this case and is going back to London. After arriving back at Baskerville Hall, Sherlock informs Mrs. Barrymore of the death of her brother and notices a portrait of Hugo Baskerville. He suddenly knows the motive for Stapleton's villainy. He is a blood relative of Hugo's and obviously just as cruel. The next morning, the plan to prove Stapleton's guilt begins. Sherlock tells Sir Henry to keep his appointment for dinner at Stapleton's and then walk home through the moors. He also tells him that he and Watson are going back to London and to tell Stapleton they have left. Then they go to the train station where Sherlock arranges for wire to be sent from London to Sir Henry confirming their arrival. Afterward, he and Watson go to Laura and convince her of the truth that Stapleton is already married and is using her. They learn that Stapleton told her he would marry her and had her contact Sir Charles for help and to meet her, then had her miss the appointment. Meanwhile, the indomitable detective Lestrade of Scotland Yard arrives on the scene after being contacted by Sherlock. Sherlock, Watson, and Lestrade spy at the window while Sir Henry and Stapleton are eating dinner. Stapleton goes to a sheet and then back inside to his guest. Unfortunately, the weather is not cooperating for following Sir Henry to protect him, but when he leaves across the moor, they manage. When the huge beast comes after him, they all shoot it. Finally, Sherlock empties enough bullets in it to stop it just in time to save Sir Henry. They discover it as a huge dog, mastiff, and bloodhound mix. It is as big as a lion and covered with phosphorescent paint. It was truly terrifying enough to frighten Sir Charles to death. When the detectives go back to Stapleton's home, the fine Mrs. Stapleton bound and gagged. Upon release, she tells them she tried to warn Sir Henry and where to find her husband. The fog is too thick still, so they decide to wait for the morning. Meanwhile, they will protect Mrs. Stapleton. The next morning, Mrs. Stapleton leads them on a market path to her husband's hideout. They find all the proof necessary, but no Stapleton. Sherlock thinks the swamp killed him. Back in London, Sir Henry and Mortimer arrive at 221 B. Baker Street. They ask Sherlock to clarify the mystery to them. He tells them that Stapleton is actually Roger Baskerville's son. After some legal trouble, he and his wife moved to the area hoping to cash in on his inheritance. He made friends with Sir Charles and discovered his bad heart. Mrs. Stapleton refused to help her husband with his plan, so he romanced Laura. She sent the note and then missed the meeting. Once Sir Henry arrived on the scene, the Stapletons came to London. Mrs. Stapleton tried to warn Sir Henry, but Stapleton stole his boot for the dog. Unfortunately, the first boot he took was new with no scent, so he had to take another, older boot. Sherlock had suspected the Stapletons from the time of the mysterious note in London because it smelled like perfume. Mrs. Stapleton did not want to expose her husband until she learned of his relationship with Laura. That was when he tied her up and gagged her. The only loose end Sherlock has is how Stapleton planned on claiming the inheritance, maybe from South America. The story ends with Sir Henry accompanying Mortimer on his vacation so he can get some rest. Sherlock and Dr. Watson plan an outing to dinner and the opera.